Funding provided by the Richard P. Garmany Fund at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. I'm Ray Hardman. On this episode of Where Art Thou, we are in Connecticut's capital city. Now, Hartford may be considered the insurance capital of the world, but arts and culture are woven into the fabric of this town. Not only do you have great historic institutions like the Mark Twain House and the Wadsworth Athenaeum, the town also has an abundance of artists, writers, musicians, live theater, live dance, you name it, Hartford has it. Now, to help us get a better handle on what Hartford has to offer, we have our Where Art Thou Hartford curator on the line, Jeffrey Kagan McCann. Jeff is a theater director, a playwright, and the founder of the Hartford Fringe Festival. Jeff, are you there? Yes, I am here. How are you doing, Ray? I'm doing great, and I hope you're doing great, and I want to hear about what's up with the Fringe Festival this year now with COVID. Well, the Fringe Festival is still going on. Uh, we're getting our acts together. We're, we are doing the uh, festival online on a streaming service on Bidmall. Uh, we are so excited that we got a lot of acts from around Connecticut, the Northeast, and our first uh, international act from Canada. Um, so we are put, hunkering down and scheduling, getting everything ready for the October 9th to November 9th shows. Oh, well, best of luck there. So tell me a little bit about Hartford's art scene. Well, the art scene is all over the place. It's great. We have a lot of fun, exciting artists who are creative from doing dance companies, from doing small theater groups, improv, um, artists, painters. It's great. Uh, and some dancers. We have dance companies in Hartford. So Hartford is building up on its legacy of theater that's been around for years. So we hope that we continue doing that, especially with uh, with a group like mine, is French Festival uh, Company. All right, well, I'm really excited to be here. Tell me where we are headed first. Uh, there's a rich legacy of jazz in our area. So we're sending you to see a jazz pianist, Damien Curtis. Okay, so tell me a little bit about Damien. Well, Damien is born and raised in Hartford. He comes from a very musical family. Uh, two of his brothers are well-known jazz musicians in the area. And Damien has decided to step out a little bit more from the jazz and do Latin and hip hop music. Oh, that sounds really neat. Uh, Jeff, we're gonna head over and see Damien. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll be in touch later in the show. Great, can't wait to see you again. All right, let's check it out. This is the Artist Collective, a real cultural treasure here in Hartford. It was founded in 1970 by the late, great alto saxophonist Jackie McLean. Think about it. So many artists, actors, dancers, and especially jazz musicians learned their trade right here in this very building. Let's go meet Damien. Hey. Hey, how, how you are doing? You? Good, how's everything going? Tell me about the Artist Collective and how important it is. Oh, it's so important. Um, I wouldn't have had my, my jazz uh, beginnings without the Artist Collective. You know, um, Jackie McLean, I, I met him when I was very young. I was 13, you know, and uh, I was playing classical at the time. And, uh, and he said, hey, why don't you just come, come hang out with us and see if you like, you know, what we're doing here at the Collective. And my dad brought me. And I was, you know, young, and uh, I didn't leave since, you know. So I ended up going through and, and ended up going to the Hart School and studied with Jackie there at the Hart School too. So, I mean, the influence that Jackie in this building had on us is, is phenomenal. You know, I just couldn't couldn't say more. Um, and and his wife Dolly, the same thing. You know, they were able to push us and and kind of guide us, you know, through this building and and what we were, you know, we learned so much that we probably wouldn't have learned and be able to absorb, you know, and, and thank goodness for Jackie and, and Hartford, we were able to say, take that, you know. Yeah. It's like bringing New York here in a, in a weird way, you know. Right, right. Yeah. 
Uh, you come from a musical family. Um, well, I have two brothers that play. Yeah. Um, one of my brothers plays piano just like I do, Zakai Curtis, phenomenal pianist. And then I have a Lucas, Lucas Curtis, another piano uh, bass player. Um, and they both came through here too, the collective. You, so you, so you, you were like a child prodigy, you were playing young. Oh, I was playing, yes, yes, but I wasn't a child prodigy, but I, I definitely started when I was four, I started young. The, the jazz that I was exposed to was mostly like uh, Miles Davis' Bitches Brew, more of the funk type of jazz, you know, mm -hmm. not as much as the traditional um, 60s, you know, 50s, uh, the bebop side. Um, that actually, actually, I got exposed to that through Jackie, you know, so that was, that was one of those things. And yeah. Do you remember the, the first jazz piece that you kind of really mastered and got under your belt? <sighs> mastered, wow. Um, I'm still <laughs> trying to master it. <laughs> um, I think one of my first, I believe I did, was Autumn Leaves, mm -hmm. was one of my first. Um, to this day, I still play that song. You know, mm -hmm. I still try to, uh, you know, so much to do with that. You know, it's, I think it's impossible to master jazz, which I think is the most beautiful thing ever. Pattern, does it is it good for someone learning to improv? Yes, to that have is. that pattern underneath them. Yep, yep, it's very important. Um, I mean, every there's, there's there's two different ways of improving. Is it's one there, you know, you can do it by theory, mm -hmm. and you can do it by ear, depending on you know which whatever one's strength, you know, um, or you do it both ways. You can add both of them together, you know, which which a lot of musicians do. You so know? when you're saying theory, like in your head as the song is going on, you're thinking. Got to jump to this. Got to go to that. Yes. Gotta, yep. That yep. seems complicated it, to me. It is. It is in the beginning. Okay. It is in the beginning. But after a while, you start getting used to it, and your ear starts picking up where you're going. You mm -hmm. know, and and your mind starts understanding how fast it's got to work to get to the next chord, from next chord to next chord to next chord. So it starts becoming. And then once you start doing that, it's like playing chess. You know, you start thinking five, six steps ahead, where you're able to play five, six, seven chords ahead. Why do you love it so much? Oh man, why do I? It's it's it's. I don't know how to explain it, but ever since I've I've been little, it, it hit me, you know, in a certain way where it's like one of those things you can't get out. I think it's also it's very danceable, you know. Mm -hmm. um, jazz in itself is probably one of my biggest loves, you know. Um, I mean, from Kind of Blue, you know, album Miles Davis, Miles Davis. To John Coltrane, Alabama. I mean, it goes on and on, you know, John Coltrane's ballad albums. It just hits you in a certain way where you're like, man, I, that's what I want to do. Let's talk about uh, jazz and hip hop. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I hear from a lot of young jazz players yep. that want to incorporate hip hop, and they say it's a truer fusion than like the rock jazz fusion from the 70s, that it seems to be a more compatible fusion than, than that. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, I guess it's dependent on the way you look at it. Um, jazz, jazz and hip hop, to me, have, they're, they're, they're very parallel. I definitely still get the idea of a rhythm section and someone improvising which to me is the vocals you know the, the 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 rhythm that the vocals are using right um with the rapping so i think you know that's kind of like how i see it you know mm -hmm. so it's almost the same mm -hmm. but different for the fact that you have a stronger backbeat than jazz is a little more it's got a little more of a tilt to it you know right but it, it's still on the same parallel you know mm -hmm. you know it's, it's crazy but i feel like it's the same you know Tell me, like, what you're thinking about when you're playing. There's so much, there's so much um, within the improvising, right? It's because it's an, it's, it's an art form of improvising, you never know. And you always think different for the fact that you always feel different, right? It's, 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 it's you're basically, you're trying to express yourself through music, right? Um, 
And it has a lot to do with feeling, what you've done today, how you ate, you know, um, what you're going through, you know. Right, all something that, that happened right before you started playing. Exactly. Yeah. So all that stuff, all that stuff comes out within your playing. So the idea is to try to gather up all that and, and bring it out as you as you're playing you know it's just like a big mixing pot and that's basically what's going through our head is that we're trying to figure out okay this is what's going here so this is what i'm hearing here or this is what i'm feeling right now so i'm gonna play a little harder you know mm -hmm. or you know so it's, it's a lot but when you start letting yourself listen to everything and, and kind of let yourself relax and take in you start realizing it's not as hard because everything just starts naturally coming out yeah you know? yeah um is there something, is, do you have like a ritual? Is there something you play every time you sit at the piano? Yeah, usually I'll go through some of the two five ones, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just to get used to the piano or what the sound is, mm -hmm. you know? Because um, again, it, even the piano itself can give you a different vibe mm -hmm. of how you're playing or what you feel. Because some pianos are, they all have their own character. When you sit down and you touch them and you know, the way they're played, it's, it's different, that the keys feel different. It's tough when, you don't get that chance. You know, you just have to get on stage and start playing. You know what I mean? Then yeah, it's right, like, uh oh, right. let me figure out what, you know, what this piano, see if it likes me, see if I like the piano. You know what I mean? Yeah, that right. type of vibe, but it's cool. You yeah. Know? Well, Damien Curtis, uh, thanks for thanks for sharing and, Thank you. and and giving us your insights yeah. into into this fascinating instrument and, yeah. and the world of jazz. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's a pleasure. We are here on Capitol Avenue in Hartford, practically in the shadow of the state Capitol building. It's here that Capitol Ice Cream serves up sweet treats and community involvement right on the outskirts of Hartford's historic Frog Hollow neighborhood. Let's check it out. My name is Chantal Boissier Kelly, and the name of my business is Capitol Ice Cream. So Capitol Ice Cream was opened um, three years ago. Um, it was a passion of my husband and I. We made ice cream at home with our children and we really wanted to open an ice cream shop in Hartford because there weren't many of them at the time that we decided. And it has been a great ride so far, lots of support from community and from far away as well. I really have a commitment to the community as a teacher, as a resident of Hartford. Of course, teaching is my passion, so I still teach. So I run from teaching to here every day. And it's really important to me to give back in any way that I can. So it, it gives me a, just another outlet to be able to give back. My favorite ice cream is chocolate of all time. <laughs> Every kind of chocolate you can think of. But I will say, since I opened up the ice cream shop, I have tried every type of ice cream, and there's not many that I can say I don't like anymore. Ice cream cakes have been very popular this season. Every time we finish one, we get a new order, so that's been really exciting. And we just started just getting really creative and really um, stretching ourselves in ways that we didn't know we could do. And every time someone says, I want this kind of cake, my first thought is, um, and then I go, you know, why not? Let's just try it. And it comes out great. And we really, it's really satisfying. And it really ties into m my creative background. Um, I'm, my background is in advertising as well. So I really love that creative piece. So this gives me an opportunity to do that. We also do ice cream cookie sandwiches. Again, using any flavor you like, any type of cookie. Um, and we roll it in any topping so people really have a good time. One of our slogans is dessert your way. So we really try to accomplish that with every um, visitor. So we have our mix up mix up. Um, it is our way of really customizing desserts for every customer that comes in. Um, they actually come in and they say, you know what? I'm not sure I want this or that. Well, we throw it all together, right? So we have some friends that come in and get a, a strawberry flavor and throw in strawberry sauce and some sprinkles and have we just, you know, mix it up really nice for them. And they really just enjoy being able to create a different kind of dessert every time they visit. And we love to do it, so it's really fun. We have a great community support. We work together really nicely on the block, supporting each other. So, and also we have the Capitol Lofts next door. So of course they all come in after dinner. Sometimes the doors are closing and of course we open every time they come in because you can't deny people ice cream. So <laughs> um, of course the businesses as they've come back since the pandemic, 
Um, they're so happy to be back in the neighborhood and so happy to see the bright color umbrellas out because that means that Capital Ice Cream is open. What we have done in the past, we've connected with schools right before the pandemic, actually. We wanted to do some fundraisers with the schools just to kind of support in any way that we can. So we're going to continue that effort. We also do kindness cones in which people come in and they're able to sort of pay it for it. Um, what they do is they purchase a, a cone at a discounted rate and we are able to share that, share that with friends when they come in, whether it's someone who's just walking by or a child in the neighborhood, they often peek in, just say, can I have a cup of water? And we, we're so happy to be able to say, come in, you want a scoop of ice cream? And you wouldn't believe how it brightens their day. And I mean, I'm talking to you about it now and I just have goosebumps thinking about what that feels like. So we actually have um, this, a wall with combs on it and people come in and they write really nice notes. And it just really puts a smile on people's face. And we really love being a part of that. We have a big, we have big pride in Connecticut and Hartford. So we want to incorporate some things that highlighted Connecticut. Um, the Yankee Doodle Dandy, the state song, the dash of nutmeg and our tiramisu you. Um, we also have our capital cone, which is our ode to the cap, the state capital. We have our charter oak milkshake. So just a couple of things to kind of really connect us to, to Connecticut, Hartford in a big way. And also to be able to just say that, you know, this is our home. No matter where we go from here, we grow from here. This is, will always be our home base. And really when, you know, when people say Hartford has it, I want to really be a part of what that means, that Hartford has it. Like Hartford is a gem and I wanted to be a part of that beautification of this area and really just being a part of saying that, you know, this is a place worth visiting. Okay, we have one last stop today on this amazing day in Hartford. Let's get back in touch with our Where Art Thou Hartford curator, Jeffrey Kagan McCann. Jeffrey, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm excited to, for where we're headed next. Where are you taking me? Well, um, how do you feel about puppets? Or should I say, how do you feel about large puppets. <laughs> well, uh, Jeff, I got to say, I hardly ever get asked that question. But since you're asking, I'm all for puppets. I'm all for large puppets. I guess that has something to do with where you're taking me. Uh, yes, uh, uh, artist Ann Coverley. For years, she's been doing these fantastical, great puppets uh, used in a variety of performances. But most notably, uh, she does a yearly event called Nightfall. Oh, cool. Uh, tell me about Nightfall. I think I've heard of it. It's a big event, one night only event, that brings the entire artistic community together. There's music, there's dance, there's costumes, and of course, Ann Coverley's amazing puppet. Uh, thousands of people come to this event, and it's uh, really a celebration of Hartford. Oh, that sounds really cool. Hey, Jeff, great job today. Thanks for the pics. No problem. Great. All right, so let's go check out Ann Coverley. We are at the Dirt Salon here in Hartford. It's a collection of studio spaces for Hartford's creative sector, including Ann Coverley. Now, this is in the Parkville section of Hartford. It's a neighborhood that's experiencing a little bit of a rejuvenation, thanks in part to the addition of a brand new food hall called the Parkville Market. Now, I'm a little hungry. I may need a lobster roll in a little bit, but first, let's go meet Ann. Hello? Hey, Ray. Ann, how are you? Good, thanks. Oh, this is magnificent. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I guess you need a big space like this to accommodate all the puppets you have. Yeah, I, I think I could, um... Any size space you gave me, I would fill it up. So. <laughs> now, before we get into talking about the puppets, t tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get, how did you get here? You know, uh, it was a long trip. I just kept following my nose. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw puppets in, I think, 1982 or 83 and fell in love. And that's how I started it all. Before that, you were doing fine art? I've been, I've done everything. Uh -huh. I've done almost any job. I haven't fixed cars, although I've fixed my own, but <laughs> um, yeah, baker, candlestick maker, you name it, I've done it. So tell me how you got onto this, this whole idea with the puppets. Really, it's about how we got to Nightfall. I just started making puppets in Hartford and 
Uh, our first puppet was in the Gay Pride Parade, and nobody was used to looking at puppets, so I could see from inside the puppet that everyone wasn't looking up, <laughs> which was really <laughs> funny. But then I just kept making more puppets, and then I had to, of course, create some kind of performance. You know, you've got all these puppets, what are you going to do with them? You have to do something, so. Yeah. We started creating performances. Before, before you started doing these large-scale puppets, I mean, were you, were you working large-scale? I'm just kind of curious, what got you to this point? Right. Well, I was traveling around the country for a couple of years, and everything I had fit in my van. And I was making small-scale jewelry. And then I moved into the Colt building into a 2,000-square-foot space. And I just started painting bigger and making bigger things now that I had big space. And I realized that big is my scale. Yeah. I like big. And I like to make things that move. And I started getting really into like how to engineer things. And Did you enjoy working with fabric? Was that part of, part of this whole puppet thing? Well, I think a lot of my material choices come from watching other puppet makers work and realizing you know, if I want to make a puppet really responsive to the puppeteer who's wearing it, then I need to work in materials that are really lightweight and flexible. I want to ask you about the very first Nightfall. Tell me about that. Uh, well, that was kind of a Yahoo cowboy effort that we, you know, I didn't know what I was doing in terms of creating performance. I don't know anything about performance. But we created a script and we, um, you know, picked the spot in Elizabeth Park and all these folks involved. And we didn't know what was going to happen or how many people were going to show up. And then it was kind of crazy because a thousand people sort of rolled into the park and sat down. And Oh, my gosh. Do the puppets change from year to year? Yeah, we make new puppets. We, the collective um, of me, make <laughs> new puppets every year. So, um, which is something I really enjoy. Now, are these from current shows or past shows or a little bit of both? I would say, yeah, because we do reuse things. Yes, past shows. We've got uh, some bee butts and some uh, firefly butts and <laughs> some squirrels and a beaver, peacock. Oh, you got your peacock up there. Yeah. This is um, peanut butter jelly monster. Okay. Brand new, hasn't, not quite completed, has not seen the world yet. Tell me about uh, this tropical fish here. That's uh, Sprinkles, and uh, it was named by a child who saw it and said that that's what we should name it. That's awesome. And Sprinkles uh, goes on a bicycle. Frog heads, and then we've got the mole and porcupine. Yes, I see porcupine. Yeah, cardinal and a new, another new one, hummingbird. And is that an owl back there? That is an owl back there. Oh my gosh. Do you fun. sketch these out before you start building them? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah. So tell me about your friend here. Uh, this is a lovely creation, magical giant puppet made by Ann Coverley. This is the acrobat. The arms and legs are connected to me. Yep. The whole puppet's connected to me. There's a, a back brace that I'm wearing that allows me to kind of become her inside and become her spirit inside. <laughs> We're like uh, two peas in a pod. <laughs> and I like the fact that when my niece sees her, she feels proud. She's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, she looks like you. <laughs> you know, and, and I just want to make sure that everybody feels happy and, and connected to Nightfall in that show in that way, the yeah. way that I do. You yeah. know, that I, we can't all be inside of a puppet, but we can all kind of take ourselves there in our imagination, in our hearts, and be a part of the show in the best way we can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is so amazing, and I got to ask you, I mean, this, this takes so much effort, and it's not just you, it's a lot of other people. Mm. Um, why do you do it? Why do you do it each and every year? Explain what pleasure, what artistic drive comes into play with this, this, this nightfall. 
Well, I mean, I love making things, any kind of thing. I mean, I have to say the, the quarantine was perfect for me because I could just stay home and make stuff all day. I couldn't do anything else. Right. Um, and I love Hartford and what Hartford has. So bringing together, you know, making large scale crazy things, bringing people together, playing, getting to play with all these amazing artists. You know, it's all, it's all good stuff. As I grow older, no matter what happens, I still want to be like in the corner making costumes yeah. for the show. Yeah. Well, Anne, this has been so great. Uh, I love your space. And, you know, I'm just so taken with Nightfall being this way to bring the Hartford community together. So thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, that was amazing. Hey, this has been a great day in Hartford. I hope you enjoyed it. You know, it's people like Anne and, and Damien that make this part of the state so special. Hey, maybe there's somebody in your town, in your neighborhood, that's doing amazing creative things. Well, we want to hear about it. Drop us a line at whereartthou at ctpublic.org. Join me next week. I'm going to jump back in the old beat-up company van and head out on another great adventure. Until then, I'm Ray Hartman. Thanks for watching Where Art Thou? Funding provided by the Richard P. Garmany Fund at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving.